from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Please welcome the Librarian of Congress, Dr. James H. Billington. Thank you very much. Good evening and welcome to this very special evening. For some time, I had hoped that William Merwin would agree to be Poet Laureate of the United States. And as the summer solstice approached this year, the stars must have been in alignment because he did agree, and I'm happy that he's here tonight for his inaugural reading as Poet Laureate of the United States. For much of his life, William Merwin has cared about the natural world in a deep and abiding way. By planting an assortment of palms, he has reforested a ruined pineapple plantation where he and his wife now live. I hope that he will speak to us not just in person in this heart, historic uh, place tonight, but virtually from the naturalistic place in his beloved Hawaii uh, in the course of his laureateship. His surroundings have entered his poems. The later poems contain a kind of meditative mist, like the one I imagine must come up in the mornings on Maui, where the poet lives and writes, often about everyday things with his beloved wife. Whatever its origin, the metaphorical mist feeds a fluid flow of thought into his poems. They have an almost magical capacity to escape the bounds of time, or at least to lengthen the present moment as in these lines from a poem entitled To the Middle. So it appears that you are here always, a stillness in the passage of days. The stillness of days takes place in his poems. They are printed free of punctuation now, while most of us are punctuating uh, our lives by rushing from one punctual appointment to another in our noisy cities, even as time itself is slipping away like beach, beach sand receding underfoot as the tide goes out. We are grateful for the quiet moments that William Merwin's poems provide us. It's a sing signal honor for the Poet Laureate to have had, as he had this afternoon, a conversation with the President of the United States. As Percy Bysshe Shelley said in Defense of Poetry, and I'm quoting again, poetry reproduces the common universe, but it also purges from our inward sight the film of familiarity which obscures from us the wonder of our being. Our new poet laureate is a master craftsman of the poetic art. He uses the English language well, perhaps in part because he has translated great poetry with loving skill from other European languages. His poetic voice is as unique as the island on which he lives, that small flowering state in the midst of the boundless ocean where our far west meets the Asian far east. He blends luminous thinking from the east into the literary structures of the west his voice periodically takes us back to those prehistoric times when poetry was heard rather than read. Yet he speaks clearly to our own time and to all time, leading us upstream from the flow of everyday things in life to the half-hidden headwaters of wisdom about life itself. Ladies and gentlemen, the Poet Laureate of the United States, William S. Merwin. Well, you've heard something that I never heard, which is what Jim Billington just had to say about me. So uh, I don't know whether I should be feeling vain or, or troubled, but... Uh, <laughs> um, 
I want to thank Professor Billington and everybody who's been responsible for my being here this evening, first of all, and everyone who's been responsible for this series because it's an extraordinary thing and it does represent something about our country that is often not represented. Um, and, um, and I want to thank Patricia Gray, who has uh, seen us through the preparations of the past few months and is a just wonderful friend to have made. And, uh, and then everyone who's come to this reading, because some of you I know have come considerable distances, and I'm honored by your having done that. I want to uh, start by reading a very short uh, few pages of prose, and I'm reading them in prose rather than try to make them up as I go along, which, uh, you know, has its virtues, but, but also you always leave things out and forget. And I just, I feel strongly about this. Several months ago, when Professor Billington and I were discussing the possibility of this occasion, he asked me whether there was any particular theme that I would like to invoke as an accompaniment to what I might say about poetry and my own poetry. Um, and, the, and I answered at once, without hesitation, that there was one, and it would be what I think is the essential relation between poetry and the living world in all its forms, that is, its source and sustenance, and the source and sustenance of the arts, of all the arts. I'm indebted to the South African friend and poet Brayton Breitenbach for quoting to me some years ago these words from a letter of William Blake's, who's a lifelong hero of mine. Uh, Blake says in the letter, the tree which moves some to tears of joy is in the eyes of others only a green thing which stands in the way. Some see nature all ridicule and deformity, and by these I shall not regulate my proportions. And some see nature, see no nature at all. But to the eyes of the man of imagination, nature is imagination itself. I, I think this to me is, a, is a, a statement of the importance of the Declaration of Independence. I mean, it's a, it's a clarification of something that the species has been trying to get to for a long time and is in danger always of losing because, uh, you know, you never get your, you never own it, you never possess it, it's never sure. <clears throat> More than 200 years later than Blake's statement, I tend to be cautious about using words such as nature and environment because to me they usually suggest that we are distinct from what they refer to. But what about this imagination that Blake refers to with such regard? In the relatively brief history of the human self-image, a number of attributes have been nominated, sometimes intol intolerantly, as the single distinguishing characteristic that sets us apart from, and a dogmatist claim, uh, renders us superior to all other forms of life, animal or botanical. One of these qualities is reason. We have been taught, and another is language, both of which are defined only by humans, from a human viewpoint. There is the soul, sometimes termed immortal, which is perhaps amorphous, which is uh, perhaps amorphous, unique, indescribable, and remains certainly unproven. Each of these has been used to assert our sole right to have dominion over, to dominate, exploit, and destroy any and every other form of life. Yet each of the special of the special qualities, however defined, seems to me partial and, and dubious. I've come to think that if there is a single capacity or trait that distinguishes our species and is our, it is our, and is our true gift, not as some exclusive development of ours, but because of the persistence of it in our present among us, 
and the authority it assumes even in the context of falsehood. It must be uh, the imagination and the, the capacity to feel distress upon hearing of the abuse of a child in another country or the torment of an animal one has never seen, to grieve at the fate of polar bears and of the homeless in, Dar in Darfur, uh, to rejoice in the happiness of others in, the surround in, in surroundings and told in another place in, in, or e even in another time, in other lives. <clears throat> Uh, and uh, I think that uh, this is this is our talent. This is what this is what is us. And uh, those of us who have had to do with the arts, uh, and I, I think that must include a great many of the people in this room. Um, I think uh, realize that the talent that is given to us is saying at the same time, use it. Use it, uh, honor it, respect it, make it part of your life, because if you don't, it will turn against you. And I think that what we're seeing now, because we're seeing the exact opposite of what I'm talking about. We're talking about greed and anger running the world and uh, taken absolutely for granted. Uh, and I think that that's the opposite viewpoint. I think, I think that we have known about that in the myths as long as there have been myths. Uh, in the great Gilgamesh epic, which is the first of the great long uh, epics that has survived, uh, uh, the, the great tree is, yes, you can cut the great tree down. The great tree which overshadows everything, which was part of everything, which was a menace, which was both a menace and the food of everything, you can cut it down. But when you do cut it down without knowing what the consequences are, death comes into the world. There was no death before that. That's a great myth. I mean, that's something that I think if you once paid attention to that, you'll never forget it. And uh, I don't think this is, I don't think these are things that ever go away. And if we ignore them, we ignore them always at our peril. Uh, I just wanted to say that in this context once, uh, at this time, in this century, uh, because I think um, we must decide what we're going to do with the time that is left to us, uh, whether we're going to live up to ourselves or whether we're not. And um, nobody will miss us, you know. Uh, but in the meantime, we, the imagination that we've been talking about made uh, Mother Teresa and made Mozart, made Shakespeare and made Albert Schweitzer. Uh, this, is, this is exceptional, but it's still us. And uh, are we gonna live up to that? That's so, um, so I want, to be, I want to begin by quoting to you a Japanese-American woman in New Jersey, and I have been working for 10 years, just um, uh, in a rather dilatory way for a while, but more, more with a lot more excitement recently, translating uh, the work of the least known of the three great haiku poets, Japanese haiku poets, I don't know any Japanese, but I work with her and she provides me with literals, with notes, with every possible background. And uh, uh, there's one that I just wanted to, to, to quote here because I thought, here we are. Uh, he says, this is a haiku, remember, very, very short. He said, vainly I listen for the voice of the cuckoo in the sky above the capital. <laughs> so I want to go start by going back and reading some poems from a few years back, I mean 50 years back.
Dusk in winter. The sun sets in the cold without friends, without reproaches after all it has done for us. It goes down believing in nothing. When it is gone, I hear the stream running after it. It has brought its flute. It is a long way. The dream again. These are some short poems from one period, one season. The dream again. I take the road that bears leaves in the mountains. I grow hard to see, then I vanish entirely. On the peaks, it is summer. I was trying in those years to get close to the base of poetry, what makes poetry poetry. Uh, one can never get to it and say, I've got it, I found it, I, this, is the, this is the pole and I can put up a flag. Oh no, that doesn't happen. But uh, uh, of course, when the poems were reviewed, there were those who said, oh well, this is a poet who doesn't want to be understood, these are incomprehensible. But then I found that people were teaching them to the sec their second grade classes. And I said, what do the children make of them? They, well, they like them. And I thought, <laughs> <laughs> I thought that's fine. The, the, the children know something that, that the, 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 their elders are still trying to understand. You know? but, and by the way, understanding. I want to keep going back to Blake because uh, uh, he, keep, he keeps coming up, and I think he, I think there, to, to me, there are two, there are two prophets to, to our world uh, from that period. One is Blake, and one is an American, Henry David Thoreau. And uh, I keep going back to them. I think that uh, they, they keep saying things that tell us who we are, which is, uh, which is the, one of the other things that the imagination does all the time. I mean, Shakespeare's sonnets don't tell you anything about Shakespeare's love life, they tell you about your love life. <laughs> How we are spared. At midsummer before dawn, an orange light returns to the mountains like a great weight, and the small birds cry out and bear it up. And there's one more of these tiny, small poems I want to read called The Dragonfly. Hoeing the bean field, here are the dragonfly's wings. From this spot, the wheat once signaled with lights, it is all here with these feet on it, my own, and the hoe in my shadow. Um, there's a different kind of poem altogether that I, that I want to read when I find it. Uh, here, it's called Fly. It's about, these are, these are animal poems and there are city poems. Um, I've had that kind of back and forth running through my life. I was born in the city and from the moment I saw the country I wanted to be there. It took a long time, but I was always, I remember the first time I heard crows when I was nine years old, and I was surprised to find the tears running down my face. What am I crying about? I mean, those, those birds, I didn't know what the connection was, but it was something about it that was so powerful that uh, the, the, it was just the crows were. Um, so this is a bird poem of a different kind called Fly. I have been cruel to a fat pigeon because he would not fly. All he wanted was to live like a friendly old man. He let himself become a wreck, filthy and confiding, wild for his food, beating the cat off the garbage, ignoring his mate, perpetually snotty at the beak, 
smelling, waddling, having to be carried up the ladder at night to the tent. Fly, I said, throwing him into the air, but he would drop and run back, expecting to be fed. I said it again and again, throwing him up as he got worse. He let himself be picked up every time until I found him in the dovecote dead of the needless efforts. So that is what I am, pondering his eye that could not conceive that I was a creature to run from. I who have always believed too much in words. There's a poem I want to read called History from a few years later than that. It's in a different landscape altogether from, from New York or from where I live now. But I, I look back and I think, my God, I'm lucky. The places I've seen and the places I've lived in. And I'm not a good tourist. I mean, I find tourism irritates me because if I'm interested in it, I want to stay for a while. And if I'm, if I'm not, if I just want to move on, uh, I get tired of doing that. I think I might as well go home, you know, from somewhere that really interests me. Um, so I, I've, I've lived places and I've, I've got to know places and to remember them with great uh, fondness and, uh, and remembering things that I didn't notice at the time. But this is one of those extraordinary places, uh, a sort of turning point in my life when I lived in a very remote uh, part of southwestern France. History. Only I never came back. The gate stands open where I left the barnyard in the evening as the owl was bringing the mouse home in the gold sky at the milking hour. And I turned to the amber hill and followed along the gray fallen wall by the small mossed oaks and the bushes of rusting arch and the, and the, the and, and the bushes of rusting arches bearing the ripe blackberries into their long shadow, and climbed the ancient road through the last songs of the blackbirds, passing the last live farms, their stones running with dark liquid, and the ruined farms, their windows without frames, facing away, looking out across the pastures of dead shepherds whom nobody ever knew grown high with the dry flowers of late summer. Their empty doorways gazing toward the arms of the last oaks, and at night their broken chimneys watching the cold of the meteors. The beams had fallen together to rest in brown herds around the fireplaces, and in the shades of the black trees the houses were full of the owl fragrance at last, mushrooms and owls and the song of the cicadas. There was a note on a page made at the time and the book was closed and taken on a journey into a country where no one knew the language. No one could read even the address inside the cover and there the book was, of course, lost. It was a book full of words to remember. This is how we manage without them. This is how they manage without us. I was not going to be long. Uh, how many years ago now? Um, 19 years ago. We, have, we had a great male chow dog. And uh, he got out on the road one night and someone enticed him with a hamburger, I suppose, and got him into a car and stole him. And we were, it completely changed our lives. We 
where he spent every day uh, sort of doing a, 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 a planning mission of what we were going to do to look for it in the, that day. And we put up um, posters and so forth and advertised and, and so on, and, you know, did all that. And finally got him back, but it took, there, there were some crucial and very, very uh, searing weeks. Um, and uh, in, then we, we were both obsessed. And I think, you know, artists pray to be obsessed, but this was, I found myself going around mumbling the same words over and over again and, th and thinking, uh, um, they don't make any sense, you know. I'm so boring, I can't talk to anybody else because there's only one thing I have in my mind now. And after I got him back, I, I was thinking of those words that I'd said all, all over and over, and I thought, all my life, the poet whom I in some ways loved most, was one of the most awful of men, was Francois Villon. And um, nobody could ever imitate Francois Villon. And I always thought, you know, I used to have dreams that I, that I found poems of mine that were just like Francois Villon. Uh, <laughs> And I'd never, I thought, you know, so much for the academic theories about influence. Uh, nothing that I've ever written reminds anybody of Francois Villon, you know? <laughs> but this poem came out in the form of a poem of Francois, of one of a particular poem of Francois Villon's, too. And, um, uh, and with some of the rhythms and many other things of Villon. So it was indebted to him, but it was about this, this sort of, nonsense, saying the same thing over and over again, called Search Party. By now I know most of the faces that will appear beside me as long as there are still images. I know at last what I would choose the next time if there ever was a time again. I know the days that open in the dark like this. I do not know where Maui is. I know the summer surfaces of bodies and the tips of voices like stars out of their distances and where the music turns to noise. I know the bargains in the news, rules, whole languages, formulas, wisdom that I will never use. I do not know where Maui is. I know whatever one may lose, somebody will be there who says what it will be all right to miss and what is verging on excess. I know the shadows of the house, roots that lead out to no traces, many of his empty places. I do not know where Maui is. You that see now with your own eyes all that is there as you suppose. Though I could stare through broken glass and show you where the morning goes. Though I could follow to their close the sparks of an exploding species and see where the world ends in ice. I would not know where Maui is. Um, Maui is a Hawaiian word. Um, that means the real McCoy, your own thing, what really belongs there. You know, uh, you say your your own words. You, you use ko ko mau o lelo maui. Uh, it, it means your own thing, uh, his own thing. He's, he's the real guy. This is the real thing, and he was. He came back. So let me read one other uh, poem of a that same kind of poem from that period, but of a different subject altogether, um, called One Story. Always somewhere in the story, which up until now we thought was ours, whoever it was that we were being then had to wander out into the green towering forest reaching to the end of the world and beyond, older than anything whoever we were being could remember, and find there that it was no different from the story 
anywhere in the forest, and never be able to tell as long as the story was there whether the fiery voices now far ahead, now underfoot, the eyes staring from their instant that held the story as one breath, the shadows offering their spread flowers, and the chill that leapt from its, from its own turn through the, hair of, like, through the hair of the nape, like a light through the forest, knew the untold story all along, and were waiting at the right place as the moment arrived for whoever it was to be led at last by the wiles of ignorance through the forest and come before them face to face for the first time, recognizing them with no names and again surviving, seizing something alive to take home out of the forest. But what came out of the forest was all part of the story. Whatever died on the way or was named but no longer recognizable even what vanished out of the story, finally, day after day, was becoming the story. So that when there is no more story, that will be our story. When there, will, when there is no forest, that will be our forest. I've been trying to say it, but... Uh, then I'm going to start jumping to, to get to some, to, to, to end with some recent poems. And I'm, I'm going to jump another 10 years or so more to a poem called Waves in August. There is a war in the distance, with the distance growing smaller. The field glasses lying at hand are for keeping it far away. I thought I was getting better about that returning childish wish to be living somewhere else that I knew was impossible. And now I find myself wishing to be here, to stay here, to be alive here. It is impossible enough to still be the wish of a child. In youth, I hid a boat under the bushes beside the water, knowing I would want it later and come back and would find it there. Someone else took it and left me instead the sound of the water with its whisper of vertigo, terror, reassurance, and old, old sadness. It would seem we knew enough always about parting, but we have to go on learning as long as there is anything. There's a whole book that was um, written about one place where I lived um, for a number, of, for well, a good bit of my life. Um, the, uh, the book is called The Vixen, and somewhere in here, I should be able to find the poems from it that I'm looking for. because I want to read that one poem. Here it is. She, the vixen runs all the way through that poem. And um, I don't know how many of you are fascinated by animals. Uh, I'm fascinated by all kinds of animals, but particularly among them of fo foxes are very high on the list. I, I think, and lots have been written, lots has been written about wolves in the last hundred years, but not very much about foxes. Uh, they're very mysterious animals. They're not like wolves at all. <coughs> in fact, they don't like each other. <coughs> the, 
This is addressed to the vixen. Comet of stillness, princess of what is over, high note held without trembling, without voice, without sound, aura of complete darkness, keeper of the kept secrets of the destroyed stories, the escaped dreams, the sentences never caught in words, warden of where the river went, touch of its surface, sibyl of the extinguished, window onto the hidden place and the other time. At the foot of the wall by the road, patient without waiting in the full moonlight of autumn at the hour when I was born, you no longer go out like a flame at the sight of me. You are still warmer than the moonlight gleaming on you. Even now, you are unharmed, even now perfect, as you have always been. Now, when your light paws are running on the breathless night, on the bridge with one end, I remember you. When I have heard you, the soles of my feet have made answer. When I have seen you, I have waked and slipped from the calendars, from the creeds of difference and the contradictions that were my life, and all the crumbling fabrications as long as it lasted, until something that we were had ended. When you are no longer anything, let me catch sight of you again going over the wall. And before the garden is extinct and the woods are figures guttering on a screen, let my words find their own places in the silence after the animals. I want to read a few poems from The Shadow of Sirius and then close with some more recent poems. The Shadow of Sirius is the most recent book. Um, the, in the middle of the, the central section of the book is a the shortest section, they're all short poems. They're all elegies. And um, I had to make it clear that they were elegies about dogs, uh, which is, you know, there are more poems that have been written about dogs than you would believe. But we don't um, ordinarily think about that. And there are people who would say, oh, you shouldn't waste that kind of feeling on animals. As though, as though anyone else can tell you what you should feel about anything, and as though uh, you, had, you could decide about those things, which of course, fortunately, you can. By dark. When it is time, I follow the black dog into the darkness that is the mind of day. I can see nothing there but the black dog, the dog I know, going ahead of me, not looking back. Oh, it is the black dog I trust now in my turn after the years when I had all the trust of the black dog through an age of brightness and through shadow on into the blindness of the black dog where the rooms of the dark were already known and had no fear in them with the black dog leading me carefully up the blind stairs. This is a lullaby poem. Good night. Sleep softly, my old love, my beauty in the dark. Night is a dream we have, as you know, as you know. Night is a dream you know, an old love in the dark around you as you go, without end, as you know. In the night where you go, sleep softly, my old love, without end, in the dark, in the love that you know.
And the third of these little elegy poems called At the Bend. I look for you, my curl of sleep, my breathing wave on the night shore, my star in the fog of morning. I think you can always find me. I call to you under my breath. I whisper to you through the hours all your names, my ear of shadow. I think you can always hear me. I wait for you, my promised day, my time again, my homecoming, my being where you wait for me. I think always of you waiting. Uh, when I was, in the months when I was writing those, those little, those poems, there's a, a poem that I had known ever since I was at, at the university, a Latin poem attributed to the, to the Emperor Hadrian. The only reason I question it, and the scholars don't, but I can't believe, I find it hard to believe, I'm sure it was Hadrian. We don't know anything else about it. We don't know who it may have been written for, to, to whom. Uh, one translation says the dying emperor to himself, or to his soul and so on. We don't know. Uh, and I find it strange that so remarkable a poem could have been the only poem that anybody ever wrote. That anybody ever wrote one poem and it was this one. But never mind, I, I don't know. I, I simply don't know. And I never, I, over the years, I read all the translations I could find of it because I was fascinated by the poem. I read French translations and the Spanish and Italian translations. I thought, none of them quite makes, quite, quite makes it. And I have a great friend who is a very distinguished classicist. And one day, I was working in the garden. One of the great things about working in the garden is that you find that in a way you don't seem to be thinking about doing anything except moving this to there, you know, and planting and digging that hole. And that is wonderful. Um, and all sorts of things can come out of that hole, you know. Um, and all of a sudden this poem came into my mind in English. And I thought if I were to put it into English, which I'd never thought of doing, that's the way, that's the way I'd want to have it. And I called up, I went into the house and called up my classicist friend and said, I've just translated that little poem of Hadrian's. And uh, he said, do you, can you say it over the telephone? And I did, and he said, it's absolutely literal. So here it is. It's called Little Soul. Little Soul, the first word of the poem is animula. Anima is soul. Animula is the diminutive, little soul. Little soul, little stray, little drifter. Now where will you stay, all pale and all alone, after the way you used to make fun of things? I want to read two more poems out of this and then some last, some later poems. Um, to Paula in late spring. Paula is my wife. Somewhere down there. Let me imagine that we will come again when we want to and it will be spring. We will be no older than we ever were. The worn griefs will have eased like the early cloud through which the morning slowly comes to itself. And the ancient defenses against the dead will be done with and left to the dead at last. The light will be as it is now in the garden that we have made here these years together of our long evenings and astonishment.
One more poem from that book called Rain Light. <clears throat> All day the stars watch from long ago. My mother said, I am going now. When you are alone, you will be all right. Whether or not you know, you will know. Look at the old house in the dawn rain. All the flowers are forms of water. The sun reminds them through a white cloud, touches the patchwork spread on the hill, the washed colors of the afterlife that lived there long before you were born. See how they wake without a question, even though the whole world is burning. The more neatly one packs these things, the more messy they get by the time you start get to unpack them. I hope they don't fall all over the place. Young man picking flowers. All at once he is no longer young with his handful of flowers in the bright morning, their fragrance rising from them as though they were still on the stalk where they opened only this morning to the light in which somewhere unseen the thrush goes on singing its perfect song into the day of the flowers. And while he stands there holding them, the cool dew runs from them onto his hand at this hour of their lives. Is it the hand of the young man who found them only this morning? Another to echo. How beautiful you must be to have been able to Lead me this far with only the sound of your going away, heard once at a time and then remembered in silence when the time was gone. You whom I have never seen, O oh forever invisible one, whom I have never mistaken for another voice, nor hesitated to follow beyond precept and prudence, over seas and desert, you incomparable one, for whom the waters fall and the winds search and the words were made listening. A small poem called Dew Light. Now in the blessed days of more and less, when the news about time is that each day there is less of it, I know none of that as I walk out through the early garden. Only the day and I are here with no before or after. And the dew looks up without a number or a present age. Wittgenstein somewhere supposed to have said that the true theme of all poets who remain poets through their lives is homecoming. I wish I knew where th that quotation comes from, and I wish I knew exactly what he meant, and I would love to have heard what, what, what he might have said on that subject, but it's an intriguing one, and this is a poem called Homecoming. Once only, when the summer was nearly over and my own hair had been white as the day's clouds for many years, for many more years than I was counting, I stood by the, gar by the garden at evening. Paula was still, still weeding around flowers that open after dark. And I looked up 
to the clear sky and saw the new moon, and at that moment, from behind me, a band of dark birds, and then another. After a, another after it, flying in silence, long curving wings hardly moving, the plovers just in from the sea, and the flight clear from Alaska, half their weight gone to get them home, but home now, arriving without a sound as it rose to meet them. Turning. Going too fast for myself, I missed more than I think I can remember. Almost everything, it seems, sometimes. And yet there are chances that come back, that I did not notice when they stood where I could have reached out and touched them. This morning, the Belgian shepherd dog, he's still young, looking up and saying, are you ready this time? Coming of age. It will not be enough to recall stills from along the way, to glimpse from, it, from its hill the long gone night pasture, the light on the river but not the river, the sunbeam on the scuffled stairs and the soundless house but not where it was going, the eyes of a dog watching from beside me, a face in shadow, Silent as an old photograph. Our meeting, our first night, and waking at home together again, I was there. These same hands, and these eyes as they were, when they wondered where it was going, where it had gone, it will not be enough. It will be enough. I want to read uh, two more poems. This one's called, this is, uh, uh, these are new and they're unpublished poems. Um, the Chain to Her Leg. Um, I don't know the ages of who, who I'm talking to, uh, all mixed, and some people may not remember Topsy. And in this poem, that's not a good thing. Uh, <laughs> Topsy was an elephant, and I'm t I tell some of her story in the poem, but just so that you know what happened. This was the year that Edison was testing the electric chair. Topsy's mother had been shot in front of her in Africa, and Topsy had been taken away as a very small uh, young elephant child. And she'd lived in captivity all her life and she'd been variously treated. She'd been brutally handled and, uh, and mistreated sometimes. Sometimes they'd been kind people, sometimes not. There was no, but no reason to be particularly trusting or affectionate to anybody that she knew until she knew them very well. And there was one keeper who badly mistreated her at one point and she killed him. She, uh, he, you know, he got in her way and she just, stepped on him. Uh, and they thought, well, there was a lot of reason for that that time. He was a mean man. And they let her go this time. But um, years later, out in uh, Coney Island, she, uh, some man fed her peanuts and fed her a lit cig cigarette with the lid end first. And she killed him. She just thought, I've had that, you know. And she just took her trunk and, you know, broke his neck. 
and that was that. And they said, well, that's, uh, that's obviously first degree murder and she must be executed. And uh, they decided that this, they would test out the, uh, the electrical apparatus for the electric chair on her. And it was a mess and it didn't work for a long time and it finally killed her. But uh, there, and there's a photograph, there's a, there's, a, there's a documentary photograph of the film of the whole thing if you're interested. But I remember reading about Topsy when I was a child and I never got her out of my mind. And I've never, as you see, got her out of my mind. <laughs> Called the chain to her leg. If we forget Topsy, Topsy remembers. When we forget her mother gunned down in the forest and forget who killed her and to whom they sold the tusks, the feet, the good parts, and how they died and where and what became of their children and what happened to the forest, Topsy remembers. When we forget how the wires were fastened on her for the experiment the first time and how she smoldered and shuddered there with them all watching but did not die, when we forget the lit cigarette the last laugh gave her lit end first, as though it were a peanut, the joke for which she killed him, we will not see home again. When we forget the circus, the tickets to see her die in the name of progress, and Edison and the electric chair, the mushroom cloud will go up over the desert where the West was won. The Enola Gay will take off after the chaplain's blessing the smoke from the black mesas, power plants, will be visible from the moon. The forests will be gone. The extinctions will accelerate. The polar bears will float farther and farther away. And off the edge of the world, the topsy remembers. I want to close with a poem that is a message uh, to a, I don't know any Chinese, and yet all my life that I can think of, I've been reading Chinese poets. Uh, I, think, I think we should remember, when we think about translation, that poetry in English, in the English language, since the beginning of the 20th century would be unthinkable as it is without translation, without uh, Arthur Whaley's and some of Ezra Pound's translations from Chinese. And the beginning of a different way of hearing the English language through the translation of Chinese. And the more one gets to know the great poets from the beginning of the common era into the Dong, into the Dong dynasty uh, and then the Song dynasty that followed uh, several, several amazing centuries. Uh, the, the connection between those poets, the natural world, the, the, the world around them, the, the, the way that they were dealing with the very things that I've been talking about tonight and uh, the way they were dealing with the relation of poetry to language altogether. Uh, and two, most of them were, most of them were Chan Buddhists. Uh, some of them were, Du Fu was a, was a Taoist. But this was, th these traditions too were very close to them and they developed along with them. And uh, you know, one thinks, oh, the, Do the golden age, the Dong period of China. And then you read a little bit about the history and the Dong period was a nightmare. And you know, in, in the middle of it was the Lushan Rebellion where 30 million people were either killed or displaced. I mean, the, this was the, 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 the civil world was, was un totally uncivil, it was, uh, you thought, God, what, how can the same species have these poets and painters, the whole origin of Chinese painting also came in the same period, 
and this kind of behavior at the same time? I don't know the answer to that. I don't know how one can be happy on a day when, the, when people are starving in Darfur. Uh, I just don't know that. I don't think anybody else does either. It's not easy. But it's not, by, it's not something to deal with by shrugging it off either. But anyway, this is called, this poem is uh, addressed to someone a thousand years ago, a Chinese poet whose poems I've loved in translation and about whom I'm fascinated, named Po Chui. A message to Po Chui. In the tenth winter of your exile, the cold never letting go of you, and your hunger aching inside you day and night while you heard the voices out of the starving mouths around you, old ones and infants and animals, those curtains of bones swaying on stilts, and you heard the faint cries of the birds searching in the frozen mud for something to swallow, and you watched the migrants trapped in the cold, the great geese growing weaker by the day until their wings could barely lift them above the ground so that a gang of boys could catch one in a net and drag him to market to be cooked. And it was then that you saw him in his own exile, and you paid for him and kept him until he could fly again, and you let him go. But then where could he go in the world of your time with its wars everywhere and the soldiers hungry, the fires lit, the knives out 1,200 years ago? I have been wanting to let you know the goose is well. He is here with me. You would recognize the old migrant. He has been with me for a long time and is in no hurry to leave here. The wars are bigger now than ever. Greed has reached numbers that you would not believe. And I will not tell you what is done to geese before they kill them. Now we are melting the very poles of the earth. But I have never known where he would go after he leaves me. Thank you. Well, we came for an evening of poetry and words, um, and certainly we have received that. Um, but there's been a much deeper gift uh, to touch our, our hearts and our minds, and uh, some of it our gut. Um, and we are, I think all of us, uh, deeply grateful and appreciative um, but also excited that this is the beginning of a poetry season um, and you'll have an opportunity to see and hear um, and live with uh, W.S. Merwin uh, again in the course of the year. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.